So I actually wanted to just say the conversation here, I want it to be interactive. Um, I think part of Nathan's goal here is to get us talking and, and get some ideas. And so uh, please don't take this as any way for me to just speak for 45 minutes, interact, interject, um, ask me questions. So I think I'm probably one of the few here that probably have the least knowledge of mining. But I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about myself so you know um, sort of my background, where I came from, and we can talk about sort of innovation and technology. Yes. What's your name? Dahlia. Okay, sorry, I can't Oh. I'm Dahlia Astervati. <laughs> so I, um, I actually, Andrew was saying something in earlier when we were talking about innovation and it feels sometimes I was fortunate because my both my parents were technology entrepreneurs and I remember when I was a kid my dad would try to illustrate the power of software and technology and he used to say something like okay let's say you have a restaurant and you work really hard to make this restaurant a success and you want to double the amount of money you make what do you do and all of us would say oh you got to you know get a new restaurant buy more staff or buy more um, equipment, hire more staff, and hope you can keep customers coming. He goes, now, if you built the software that everyone likes, you don't have to put any of that in place. People will just buy it, and you copy and copy and copy, and you can uh, pretty much create as much revenue as you want without continuous overhead. And that's actually what got me really excited about technology, because it was this like virtual thing that you can create, and people use it and as they give you feedback you implement more and more features but it goes to the point earlier around value creation but um, I somehow found myself in systems engineering and I got really excited about neural networking in around 2004 and I always like to say this like we talk about machine learning and AI it's been around since 1956 it's nothing new and I think if you understand the parameters behind it, which is what is making it available today, maybe mining can exp you know, learn something from that. But really, what ended up happening is I got so excited about solving problems. And I ended up working for some really great startups. And one thing I don't know is corporate culture or coming in and, and, and doing it. First was a company that actually spun out of Nortel after internet uh, came out, they kept saying, you've got to do something different with the internet. Nobody wanted to change. A couple of us got out, created real-time billing systems for telcos. Um, marketing, as digital became ubiquitous, people said, hey, we've got to get emails into marketers' hands. This is not a tech job. This is not an IT job. Marketing automation uh, then spun out of it. And so one thing that I think I want you to uh, look at me or, or ask me questions about isn't necessarily about mining, but the exposure I had to some really interesting leaders that just plowed through the noise to, to, to convey what it is they saw a vision and how they actually competed with giants to make that first sale. And of course, as much as I am a fan of technology, people always trump technology. I think part of the challenge that I see in a lot of industry talks is it's a battle between people and software, people and tech. And you know, it, it's, it's a really complex thing to try to pretend technology will solve a complex problem. We always have to consider them enablers, not necessarily um, a, a solution that is in a box. I'm gonna use this word one time because like you, Nadine, earlier, I actually refuse to use the words innovation <laughs> and disruption in any presentation because saying it is actually not innovative. What's, what's this picture of? Gold? It actually is uh, a microscopic view of gold, but if you actually take a, a very sort of binary view of it, it's exactly what data looks like um, for, for entrepreneurs or, or technology entrepreneurs. I've never seen such a notebook. Pardon me? <laughs> but poor, well, one thing uh, about innovators is they don't buy stock photography. No. Is this, uh, a, is this a Rorschach test? <laughs> Pardon me? Is this a Rorschach test? Level 
psychosis. No, I actually, well, I'll tell you how I picked this up. I went and found, uh, actually, it's a really interesting thing. I used an image recognition software that went and, and gave me access to as many gold um, uh, pictures, but the, the metadata I said, it has to be non, uh, you can't recognize it. So even the image recognition software had to make, had to ask itself, you know, only reveal the ones that were so difficult to recognize as gold. And I thought that was kind of cool um, that, you know, you can uh, learn something about it without you understanding gold in itself. But I started looking at it and I said, wow, you know, it's actually really similar. The thing is, what I see as a technologist isn't the speckles of gold. It's actually all the data outside of it um, that I see as value. And that's when I went in and So I learned that a good gold mine has 8 to 10 grams of gold per ton. Um, that is pretty much 0.008% of the amount of structured data in the average bucket. Where in comparison to, um, you know, so all the waste, I guess you would call it, where we're all trying to find efficiency in finding a 0.008% chance of success. But the Googles and the Apples and the Alibabas, they have actually harnessed a way to monetize the 99%, which is what we call unstructured data. And that's exactly it, is how do we actually extract value and apply it back to the things that could be more traditional, like gold. And that's where we find more gold. And I sort for the pun. Um, I am new to, to the mining industry. So I actually sort of, and, and Nathan, you know, we kind of, I really did a really high level view of what it takes to go and find a mine, extract it, and monetize it. And it really looks very similar to what the data mining field looks like. So you start with a pit, we start with a little repository or a database. You crush it, but we find a data model. We try to organize all that, all that data in a way that makes sense. Consider it like a spreadsheet. We then extract it in, in gold, we transform it. We take that spreadsheet and, and create 10 more fields in between it. We look for metadata, we, we give it organization, we give it sequency, we give it uh, all kinds of elements to then find patterns. And where that patterns end up revealing to us are ways we can take little bits and, 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 and take that one slice of data and take 10 different insights that we can share and monetize. Where I think in mining, once it's sorted, whatever you were sort of perp um, you know, proposing to get, you then take that to market and sell, and then you do the process all over again. Does that sound fair? Now, I was trying to make, pardon me? Oh, sorry, I thought I heard something. Uh, I was trying to make my thesis that data mining and mining Data, mining for data are very similar. Um, but to the context of innovation and how growth has dramatically changed, it really started puzzling me around, well, why isn't the evolution there? Um, and if anyone is interested, I actually tried to create an easy visualization. But I took the three main innovative um, sort of industries that since the Industrial Revolution, where, which are really silicone um, communications or wireless and nanotechnology, and mapped the amount of technology and, and speed to, to success. And what was really, really interesting is it went from, you know, some, you know, it was like one every 10 years made it, where in the last 10 years, 10,000 new companies uh, uh, basically took all of 100 years of technology innovation and reshifted two new business models, which I thought was pretty interesting. So the data mining velocity problem. So I, th I think this is, I've heard this here, and, and this is not even a really good uh, snapshot of all the data that is captured, but I thought this was really interesting. I saw it the other day. So in one second, you get about terabytes of data coming out every second. 
Um, but what's really unique, and I started thinking about this, is one is actually dependent on the other, and the other, and the other, and it compounds. But when you really think about it, that's just one second. You know, if you're looking at an entire process of, you know, relationships and business uh, communication and finding new ways of doing things, it's impossible to do it at a micro level or at a human level, as we say. Um, and that's really the illustration of what needs to happen to evolve our ability to kind of get out of the pit, um, with pun intended. So. Really, uh, something else my, my father taught me um, at a really early age is he said, if you want to do something really powerful in software, you have to treat it like a commodity. Because if it's a commodity, you focus on the scale. You don't focus on the unique aspects or the features and functions that will really, really become obsolete pretty much the day you release it. Um, and, and, and if you, that's kind of the second point here was, if data mining is so similar in, in process of mining for gold, well, let's look at some really interesting things about cost. You said the LHD uh, issue. All of these things are what made machine learning impossible to commercialize. In fact, I was actually at a Google conference and someone asked me uh, to talk about the first neural net uh, I built. And it was actually extracting Twitter data. And I had taken pr probably 20 tweets, and if I were to go through the, the neural net in the technology or the hardware I had, I had to wait seven years to get that input uh, model to, to do something valuable. Seven years. Today, that happens in nanoseconds. And that's actually what's changed in technology, is the vehicle to commercialization has almost zero barriers to entry. And what's really cool about um, what the software industry is doing is open source. What we've decided is it's no one really, um, if software is completely disrupted day after day, why don't we create standards around open source technology? So we don't have to compete for design or frameworks. We actually compete based on value that we create. And that allows us to all work off same, same standards. And we don't actually go into companies selling something that isn't valuable. But for example, the cost to data mine 10 years ago at a, at a reasonable scale was $1.7 billion. Uh, today, IBM and uh, puts out Watson free to use. And they're doing this at hundreds of dollars um, for customers. It's actually really, really cool to see. The growth in the past two, 20 years in terms of companies at the level of high growth that actually value data and the, the, the sort of processing or the consumption of data has gone up at, at scales that are almost hard to imagine. In fact, you know, it's what really makes a, a company in, in the software industry valuable today is its data assets, not necessarily anything else. Um, over 1,500 companies and business models were discovered. And I know I, I, it's not necessarily business models that are unique, but this, this shifts. I talk about history of computing. And in fact, that's actually something we do a lot to actually try to improve our sales process. If you look at the era of the first computer, um, you know, we went from distributed systems to consulting, distributed systems to consulting. And then we stumbled on this thing called software as a service. You know, the cloud enabled us to do things virtually at uh, what we call rental uh, software. But now what we're going to is a hybrid model. We're actually taking the software as a service and the cloud and figuring out ways to consult in little micro packets. Um, and that's where all these business models are generating value. So originally this, this slide was going to be a little pessimistic, but I thought before I kick in um, a question is, when you actually look at data mining, like who here actually cares what data mining is? You know, like what is it? How do we use it? You know, AutoCAD. Um, you know, it's, it was a tool created to help us create things. 
it enabled us to uh, work off uh, standards and, and, and get things done. Uh, you know, this is him creating a wheel. wasn't executed as great as I thought. But, you know, we then evolved to, and you showed that slide, and that was a really, what did he say? He said it was a pizza. Yeah. Yeah. Or that, actually. <laughs> Introducing Domino's AI pizza. <laughs> Probably happening, but uh, 1986, um, you had that slide, which was really cool, where um, I think around 1985 was the actual introduction to a lot of automation in industry. And in fact, we, we, we use this number a lot, um, or we use it as a pivotal moment when we actually realize who are the industry leaders that can't get evol evolve. <coughs> because they actually believe that automation was their innovation vehicle. Um, you know, and, and that becomes a really big challenge, but we then made things happen faster. So this is like a supply chain. Um, now, what's happened in the last five years is it's sort of transferred. We realized that automation made us uh, really kind of uh, redundant, but there was a lot of human error in the process. And so we started implementing systems to almost check the human uh, side of things. But what I end up starting to say is, well, it's telling the person what to do, or it's, or it's, or it's giving it metrics and feedbacks and not reminding us what those metrics mean when we want to do something else. And the future is, is really around, are we looking at ourselves in the machine or is the machine looking at us? But one thing I want to mention, when I'm, when I'm involved with AI conversations, I actually don't view AI as the autonomous vehicle world. I actually think it's, it's scary to think that if you think an autonomous system is going to replace you, you've completely misunderstood the value of machine learning. Um, and, and that's what I always try to advocate. Uh, it's good to remove these things, but machines will always just be uh, absolute. They're binary. They help remove, um, you know, uh, pr they, they're great for process, automation, heavy tasks, reminders. Uh, humans are still, you know, s decision makers. They can do strategy. So every time you look back and you look at your day and you say, oh, I've used all these systems, how many of them have actually allowed you, so I hope that thought, to do something more valuable that day? If you think there's room, then you have op an opportunity to implement machine learning in your in your uh, day to day. Sorry, Andrew, you had a question? Yeah, you, you say machines don't develop strategy, but is that not, um, was machine strategy development not demonstrated during the AlphaGo competition? Uh, good one, but it learned the parameters defined by the game rules. So it gave, it, it's actually a, it's not strategy, it's efficiency. Because it actually applied, it allowed to do a million plays defined by the system. You know, that's, I, I know uh, DeepMind and I have a lot of respect for them. That's actually what is, is their thesis isn't around building tools that are, uh, can think for themselves, it's how they learn the ambiguity. So instead of consuming the dictionary 5,000 times, can they find ways to, to consume the dictionary to retain the, the contents? But didn't, uh, so didn't AlphaGo 1 actually go beyond what AlphaGo did? Wh it hasn't played anything else. Uh, it's constantly playing. But it's Go, right? It hasn't gone in That's and, well. yeah. Yeah, it, okay. But again, it's, well, no, that's a very different thing. That's actually machine learning. So they wouldn't even consider that AI. You know, and I always say, think of AI, and this is a very s simple term, but AI is a really, and it's great for IoT, energy, mining, where you give uh, a set of, you know, you define a set of parameters and, and, and rules, and you allow a system to operate in those rules, learning or understanding what it should do more of or less of. And as it, as it gets its you know, uh, wrist slapped, it gets better and better. And the example I like to share is the Google uh, autonomous vehicle. I don't know if anyone remembers when there was a Google uh, car that fell off the ditch a, a year ago or so. 
And this was, this was one of these, oh, you know, doomsday, like autonomous vehicles are gone. But what they learned was it actually operated, you know, brilliantly in the rules it, it gave. What it didn't realize, and just for anyone, it was trying to take, uh, take over a, a bus and it realized it couldn't do it and it fell into the ditch. <laughs> and, you know, everyone thought it was not going to happen. And, you know, here is where the, the challenge goes. The AI was, you know what, we didn't actually realize that the other contributing parties, like the bus driver, may have not really given a crap whether this car wants to pass or not. And if we applied machine uh, or facial recognition, that autonomous vehicle can actually score whether it's going to make a successful pass or not. <laughs> and that's what happened. Um, now, I don't know if, you know, will it learn all the facial recognition, uh, you know, s decisions? But that's where I think it gets really cool. The difference is, it, you know, I'm not one of those people that says the robots are coming and, and we're gone and all of us are going to be unemployed because we still have to determine what we value as efficient, where, where what we value as, as value, or value add. But wouldn't the bus have uh, no driver, no official? Well, and then that's when we're all just <coughs> do Well, no, that's when we, we create hovercrafts, <laughs> which, which, which is very possible. We say, you know, if you don't know what to do, just fly three feet and, and solve the problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Machine learning is where I get really excited, which is around finding patterns unimaginable. And, you know, Nathan and I share a lot about this, the laws. I, uh, you know, I call this the law of white space, and it's not a real law, but it's really around, rather than trying to find something better at the same thing, uh, and I think Einstein said that's the sort of uh, definition. definition of insanity, it's find patterns unimaginable and cross into cross that learning into what you're doing. And we do this a lot um, at what we, you know, we just sit there and say, well, you know, restaurants do this. Why don't we apply that and see if it works? Uh, but what's really interesting is if you, if you just say, well, what's in between my two steps? Is there something I can find? And I was sharing this with Nathan. If someone actually has to call the next, um, what, the loader or the crusher onto the mine, what if you actually can find ways that it, it signals uh, and uses traffic patterns and, and weather patterns to actually make sure, you know, at the, the lowest cost of gas and, the, you know, the, the bus driver's availability, uh, not bus driver, excuse me, um, you know, that we can, mar you know, take margin off the cost of producing gold rather than doing the whole thing systematically and waiting to see what our margin is. So I thought I would take three lessons, and I really want uh, questions or anything, but first lesson is be ready. Don't be innovative. Um, you know, being ready and, and something we do is, is actually starting to plant the seeds of the things you need to be paying attention for so that when you find the enabler, such as a technology solution, you can then adopt it. Remember, the technology is not the answer. It's understanding the complexity of the business process you want to change to create value or, or extract more value. And you can't do that if you're just defined by the, the current models you have. Um, you know, it's funny, it's like the, the industry has evolved so much, but I sometimes think like, wow, am I really that old or has technology passed? Because I remember a time when we would sell emails to CMOs and CEOs, and the, the, pe the feedback was, do marketing people need email? Uh, we had pushback all the time, you know, why do, why do marketers need any technology? Today, just so you know, the marketing technology budget is sometimes 10 times more than the CIO's budget of an average company. And this all happened just in the last five years. Social. I used to have conversations with people and they said, well, you know, I don't think we're going to invest in this stuff. It's just for kids. <laughs> and then, you know, the Dell thing happened. Uh, Dell executives and every executive woke up to seeing their company on the news 
and they didn't see it coming because it, the kids did, but not them. Um, don't wait for that to happen. You know, it's, it's always someone's value proposition to use your demise uh, as a, and that's, you know, and that's really what it is. Fear doesn't uh, enable you to think bigger. Second lesson we learned is the business model is evolving. So cost or control used to be a way of selling technology. You know, I built this, this interesting thing and I'm gonna hoard it and build a cartel out of it. ADP is a really good example, and I, I don't mean to throw them under the bus, but with banks. When we used to wanna go and say, you need more data structures, you're using a very old system, ADP found a way to communicate with the executives that they cannot do this. They won't do this because they wanted to protect their billion dollar business. And then all of a sudden, it just took one person to say, hey, actually the cloud exists, ADP can stay there, but you can now connect to ADP and we'll do it for you for free. And they lost the opportunity to actually take that $1 billion run rate and make it 20 because they didn't want to evolve and they didn't want anyone to, to be in. The business model is constantly changing. You know, we were talking about this earlier uh, and I do love that slide you did. I did this, uh, reason I liked it is I, I recently did this comparison. Uh, in 19, uh, ooh, I won't, don't quote me on this date, but it was something like in 1990, Toyota was considered the largest company in the world or revenue wise. And you know, it, let's say for every $40 billion it made, it had about 350,000 employees. If you look at Google today, when it hit that revenue, it had about 30,000 employees. And that's not a good thing either, but what it indicates is that people are not part of the process. People are part of the engine that keep creating value for a company. Um, and so the, the business models constantly evolve. I have this theory of what, we'll get to that in a second around mining and value creation. Um, it takes a lot to realize what you're trying to sell. Um, you know, because by the time I come and say, I found this really tech great widget for you, 50 other people are knocking on the door who've produced it at a very low rate are gonna sell it. The thing that maintains that, that hold with your customers that we learned in the software industry is if you can change their behavior and make, motivate them to wanna do it over and over and over. Um, I think I have already kind of given it away, but I like this slide a lot because I, I always show this, especially when there's bankers and you know VCs in the room. I'm like, okay, I've got these two companies. Which one should I put my money in? They're like, oh yeah, hockey stick. You know, 1500, I like that price point. Let's do it, let's do it, right? Why wouldn't you? And then that's what it looks like. And so when you mention innovation to me, I say, well, why didn't you see this coming? You know, Netflix called Blockbuster and asked them to buy them for $50 million once upon a time. And Blockbuster said, nah, you're not big enough for my market. Today, Netflix is valued at $90 billion. Now, what Netflix doesn't say is they're not a studio. They have no intention of wanting to be a studio. They don't even want to take out Hollywood. But what they want to do is they've created a, a way to get their customers engaged and they have to feed them what they want. Amazon never intended to be the retail killer of the world. It just wanted them to rethink the way they buy stuff online. And once they learned how they do that, they just kept giving them what they want. So think of that. Um, is this how it always is, or is this just a really nice rendition? Uh, <laughs> And it's still like that. No, I'm just. At least half the time they have to be full of something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's just that's just one of the. Uh, I was going to say something Were you not terrible. That's all thinking. Um, <laughs> it's full of gold. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta spend some time thinking. How you're um, but you know, I started thinking. Well, how can I provoke some thought? I, I by no means think I can disrupt mining uh, on my own. Um, but I think there are a few people who could, if you actually rethink the incentives 
in how people get paid. You know, I actually have this mission where I'm going to call up or I'm going to hunt the Sears Canada CEO because he actually got his bonus this year. And that's really, really, really sad um, because they, you know, no one else did. Um, and if you think about that, that's why he had no incentive to change his suppliers. That's why he had no incentive because people allow the leadership to get compensated in an old paradigm. And the only way you can disrupt that is if you change it. And actually, Google does that very well. So the waves uh, of innovation, really, as even I, I read in mining, uh, I, I got a hold of some really interesting old um, Deloitte studies, PwC, used to talk about these waves. And we had years to adapt them. And I think the only message I have today is, you know, even as, as tech startups, they're, they're happening in, in waves that are in, in seconds. And, and I think that's the other thing. You want to ha you have an idea, you have to do it in one step, or don't bother. And things that I thought would be interesting to, to really rally is, don't talk about innovation, talk about, in, you know, take data you have and apply what other industries are doing. Collection of data. You know, I, I think sensors would be the most awesome thing that can um, be implemented and, and not with a plan. Just throw them everywhere and then find those patterns. It has to be in real time. Um, you know, I, I have this uh, thing I always share with banks who invest hundreds of millions of dollars into data science technology and, and you know, scientists. And they say, oh, they're working on really, really, really fancy stuff. And I say, great, so you spent a year coming up with the exact moment where you lost your customer. Who cares? It's, it, the moment has passed. And that's really the message around real time is how proactive can you find moments to shift behavior? Bandwidth. Bandwidth is now um, entirely um, uh, well, available or ubiquitous. Uh, and if you have that, can you apply different technologies at different layers? Mineralogy, back to that gold thing. Can you start using nanotechnology or can you actually use machine learning to infer and imply different min mineralogy so you can navigate uh, your cells through your minds and, that's, and just be dynamic? Um, you know, the, the few people I've spoken to in the industry will say, oh, that's a good idea, but I have to put it in the, in the, in the, the model and see if it will work. Well, that model has already been disrupted um, because if that truck could be, you know, altered, maybe that financial model is different. Financial modeling isn't the way Amazon or Google measure themselves. There's a, a, there's a p and angle, but they look at how much they can impact on your time or your day. Uh, and you said it earlier, two hours are spent. Um, the difference here is Google doesn't want just your ad revenue. It wants more. And, and that's the underlying secret. So I will, uh, I will send this group the, the few articles. Uh, Google recently bought a mine uh, in Kazakhstan. I don't know how many of you knew that. Are you in innovation? Well, at least that's a good thing. But, sorry. Um, but what's interesting is they also signed a government deal with Kazakhstan to get to be the, the steward of the data. And so to the OMF, what it needs to do is not create standards between vendors and suppliers. It needs to start standards with outside data suppliers. Um, but I was like, wow, is this really interesting? And that's why I liked Andrew's slide, because it's like, Google's here, and mining's there. What is it that they want? And then I said, well, there's a few things. And this was the best depiction. This is currently Alphabet's business group. I mean, we all know them as these guys. You've got energy, you've got capital, you've got fiber, you've got it all. And one thought I, I started thinking about is, did they buy this mine to just complete the value chain they want because they, they need the gold and the copper and they're just going to mine it themselves at the margins they think it should be? Or are they trying to disrupt mining itself? And uh, that we'll never know. But I think what's a really interesting use case there is look at the assets they have and compare that to the assets of the mining industry. And if you had to kind of make this a chessboard, who do you think can start from scratch 
faster and, and quicker. And, and that might help you wonder where the gaps lie and, and what you really need to do when it comes to innovation. And sort of my little tidbits uh, to summarize is, you know, the law of white space. My theory around, you know, something I just said there is, is don't, don't look within your own uh, sort of domain for the answers. That just will allow you to make things efficient. Rewriting a story takes someone that, that leaves uh, and looks at how other people are doing it. Find the supply chain to get some, some, some answers. Um, learn from consumption. You know, we talk about pricing. Well, what if, what if you knew that and are able to deploy resources differently to maximize uh, margin? I mean, that would be my first thing if I took over one of these mining companies, is I'd say, I actually know the cost to deploy everything within this supply chain. Let me manage it that way and build a predictable model to maximize my profit uh, against the commodities price. People are a strategy. Don't treat them as replaceable. If they don't want to be replaced, or if they don't want to grow, let them go. <laughs> uh, hey, that rhymes. But, um, but really, when you look at AI, it's not about getting rid of people. It's about giving them back the time to make really important decisions. <laughs> and again, process is automation. Um, and, and last thing is, don't get caught up in, in the language and the hype that's going out there with tech. It's going to be a long, long time before the robots come. But what's, what really will happen is the cross-industry. Um, do you know how many uh, tech entrepreneurs I know in the Valley who, ha who just started their own VC companies because they didn't like the way the bankers were doing it? Uh, you know, the money ball, um, sports management. There's so much interesting things um, that are happening that aren't talking about technology. Um, they're really changing value and what they think they bring to companies.